um, we would like to um, to make sure that uh, we'll have a flow of uh, several panelists. So this is a, a packed schedule, but uh, hopefully we'll go through them uh, without too much technical issues and hope that the challenges, that everything will be okay. If you do have um, any questions, you can uh, chat directly to me or to Alex uh, on the chat. I would like to take a minute to thank Alex, uh, Mernush and Huberta for working a lot in the preparation of this meeting and making sure that all the technical details are taken care of. Um, and uh, with that, we'll quickly start. So uh, the theme, uh, well, sorry, before we start, I would like to make a, a, a land acknowledgement. Uh, to acknowledging the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. Um, while we're meeting in a virtual platform, I'd um, like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we all come from and that we reaffirm our commitment and res responsibility in improving the relationships and uh, in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So thank you for all. The panel that we have today is a uh, great uh, mix of special uh, experts in the aspects related to children with disabilities. This event uh, is being co-sponsored by a few of us, a few organizations that you see listed in this slide. Um, and myself as the Canada Research Chair in Childhood Disabilities Participation and Knowledge Translation. Uh, Jane Frisbicker, the uh, Chair, Canada Research Chair in um, Childhood Disability Policy. And, um, all these organizations that you see, Kids Brain Health Network, Childbright, CASTA, UNICEF, the Canadian Human Rights Commission, um, Statistics Canada, and the Canadian Coalition on the Rights of Children, all of those organizations that will be contributing to this discussion, that hopefully we can advance the discussion in promoting inclusive environments for the full implementation of the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities for Children and uh, providing the example from Canada, but hopefully uh, giving perspective and discussions that can be used and applied in the broader uh, international context and fostering this discussion. So with that in mind, if we can, so we will uh, start our um, presentations today with um, Tabata. Uh, so we'll have uh, those three areas that uh, we'll be addressing. So a little bit of the background on CRPD, uh, reporting and domestic monitoring. We'll talk about research and we'll so propose solutions and we'll have a time for questions uh, and answers. And uh, with no further ado, we'll start with Tabitha Tranquilla. She's uh, the director of the Canadian Human Rights Commission um, and uh, she'll be talking to us about domestic monitoring. Um, and so Tabitha, I'll pass you the mic. Well, thank you very much, Kiko. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with all of you this evening to talk about this very important topic. As Kiko mentioned, um, my name is Tabitha Tranquilla, and I am the Director of Policy Research and International Relations at the Canadian Human Rights Commission, which is Canada's national human rights institution. Uh, maybe we'll go to the next slide. I'm not controlling the slides. Thank goodness, or you wouldn't see anything. Um, so, as I, I mentioned, uh, the Canadian Human Rights Commission is Canada's national human rights institution. Uh, we sometimes refer to it as Canada's human rights watchdog. Uh, we are a body that is independent from government with a mandate to promote and protect uh, human rights. Most people are, are familiar with our complaints handling mandate, so we receive complaints of discrimination uh, about the about employment and the provision of services within federal jurisdiction. Uh, and uh, the vast majority of those complaints uh, uh, relate to the, the ground of disability. But beyond that, we have, we have a larger mandate uh, to promote and protect human rights in Canada, regardless of whether that is related to discrimination per se, uh, and regardless of where it's happening. As part of that mandate, we monitor Canada's implementation of its international human rights obligations, including those under the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So, uh, you know, everyone I think uh, who's on this call is very familiar with the fact that the CRPD uh, is a, a very unique treaty in the international system, uh, which seeks to correct some of the deficiencies uh, of the traditional 
periodic review process whereby states parties every four years or so come to a committee in Geneva and provide reports about how they're doing and implementing and, and civil society and others provide their views. The committee is, issues some recommendations, everyone goes away and largely it's forgotten uh, for the next four years. The CRPD attempts to correct that deficiency by uh, obligating states parties to the convention to designate a domestic monitoring mechanism that is responsible for ongoing monitoring of the implementation of the CRPD. When the Accessible Canada Act was passed uh, in June 2019, the uh, Canadian Human Rights Commission was designated as a body responsible for monitoring the Government of Canada's implementation of the CRPD. It was a long time coming. Canada did ratify in 2010, uh, so it did take almost 10 years for them to designate a body, but we're very happy to uh, have been designated with this important responsibility. Uh, and I, you know, I, I'm going to be quite short in my remarks today because I very much want to cede the floor to my colleagues from civil society, for, to my academic colleagues, and all of those, uh, those wonderful, uh, brilliant people uh, who you will be hearing from today, uh, because it's really, uh, it's really them uh, who, who, it's really they uh, who will, who will provide the expertise that will guide the monitoring process. So it's very important to us at the commission that we are working not in consultation uh, with civil society and with others, uh, but in real partnership with them. I'll go to the next slide. Next slide. There we go. Um, so with that in mind, uh, you know, we are, we're, I think I'm talking to an audience from beyond Canada today, from to a global audience. And so I'll just say that, you know, before the commission was designated as a monitoring mechanism, we had taken a look out there uh, at what models exist uh, for, you know, what frameworks exist for monitoring the CRPD in other countries where uh, there was a body that was designated. And what we found is that there are a number of different options uh, and a number of different models um, and a lot of good practices and some lessons learned. And so what we wanted to do uh, at the outset was to create a made in Canada model for monitoring that really, as I said, works very much in partnership um, or exists as a partnership between <clears throat> civil society and us as the, the body responsible for monitoring. To that end, we wanted to start by making sure that we heard from people, uh, from rights holders, uh, from representative organizations, from academics, from other experts, from just average Canadians uh, about what, they're, what they think of when they think of monitoring, uh, what they think of when they think of the CRPD, what their priorities are, and what they want to see out of monitoring. What would make them care about that and for it to be meaningful in their life? So, uh, unfortunately, as we were preparing for this process of, of going to communities and speaking um, to people and meeting with people, uh, we were struck with the pandemic. And so we had to shift gears a little bit uh, and move our engagement online, which we recognize, you know, not ideal uh, for reaching everybody. Uh, but uh, be that as it may, uh, we, we conducted a survey in June and July of 2020, uh, and we reached almost 3,000 people through that survey who provided us with some really valuable information about what their priorities are and what their views are with respect to monitoring uh, and what they would like to see, how they would like to participate in this process. Following that, we recognized that there were some you know, we had asked for some, some demographic data to look at who it is that we, we were able to reach through that survey, uh, and more importantly, who we weren't able to reach in that survey. So in, you know, over the course of the last few months, uh, we, we followed on the initial survey with some virtual engagement sessions 
And we specifically targeted the participation of those who we did not hear a lot from in the survey. And one of those groups uh, was youth. Uh, and so uh, we, had, we had a better uptake, uh, I think, in the, the virtual engagement uh, sessions that we held over the last few months. But certainly, uh, still, you know, we're still looking to make sure that we're designing a framework that includes the views of children and youth. Moving forward uh, in terms of monitoring, we're now at the point where we're putting together a framework for what that monitoring looks like. So what are the priorities going to be? Uh, what are the, the products going to be? What are the outputs of monitoring going to be? Uh, and how are we going to ensure that this is an ongoing collaboration and an ongoing partnership? What supports do we need to provide uh, to rights holders, to representative organizations, to others in order to allow them to be able to truly participate in monitoring in a meaningful way. I'm going to go to the next slide. And as I said, I'm going to be quick. Um, so uh, we are going to, uh, to you know, propose a framework for how monitoring is going to work. It's going to be an evolutionary process. Uh, that will, you know, will will make a lot of mistakes and then seek solutions to correct those mistakes, all with a view of, you know, the most important thing being a real partnership. Um, and so I, I, I'm really, uh, I'm excited to hear the rest of the presentation this evening because these are colleagues with whom uh, we will continue to work in partnership uh, in order to to make sure that monitoring uh, can be real and meaningful and, and really move the bar forward. And the last point I wanted to make is that uh, we, you know, we're talking about the CRPD. This is the Conference of States Parties to the CRPD. Uh, but I think, I think what I want to impress upon everybody is the importance of not limiting our view to just the CRPD. Uh, the importance of looking at the intersectionality of all rights. Uh, and that's, uh, I, I really enjoy the theme of, of this particular side event that brings uh, a bit of this, the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities together. And looking at mainstreaming disability related issues across all of the treaty bodies, which is something that really hasn't happened uh, into any meaningful uh, degree over the course of, uh, certainly if I look back at the reviews of Canada, uh, that really hasn't happened. And that was an impetus for the development of the convention uh, of the CRPD in the first place. So there's, there's a real importance um, to making sure that we're looking at those intersectional issues and that we're highlighting uh, where those exist uh, and where, uh, where the rights of persons with disabilities, of particular groups with disabilities, need to be highlighted uh, in other fora relating to other treaties. And I'm going to leave it at that um, and turn it over to uh, my very learned colleagues. I thank you again very much for having me here tonight uh, and, uh, of course, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kathy Vandergrift. I'm with the Canadian Coalition for the Rights of Children. So I'm going to give you a little bit of perspective from the civil society side, and then you'll hear from Steve Esty as well. Canada claims a global reputation as a leader in children's rights, but at home, we wish it would live up to that reputation. Children's rights are often treated as a nice ideal, a great idea, but they're not taken very seriously. The convention, for example, is not yet part of Canadian law. So we are making a slow move from aspiration to actually implementing children's rights in Canada. 
The Canadian Coalition for the Rights of Children is promoting a shift to begin to see rights-based approaches as an asset or a benefit for children and the community, but also for governments, because often monitoring and rights-based tools are seen as a nuisance or an obligation or a paper exercise. We think if we can reposition them as a benefit to society, we will make more progress. I'll just name a few examples. Using a children's rights impact assessment at the beginning of a policy process can lead to better policies. The child-centered integration that you see in the Convention on the Rights of the Child can add value to the typical siloed programs we see in Canada. And a focus on outcomes in the monitoring processes can be useful to see results. Next slide, please. So we want to see reviews as real opportunities for improvement. Right now, Canada is undergoing the fifth, sixth review of children's rights. We're still dealing with some of the same system issues as the first review. And we're doing the second review under the CRPD at the same time. So to take advantage of that, the civil society organizations are working together at the intersection of the two, hoping to foster some real concrete progress in Canada. So our objective is to make these review processes more effective and more productive than they have been. And our goal is real life improvements for children. I'll quickly list some of the common areas of focus across the two conventions for civil society groups. First is the lack of data and analysis in government reports. That's after 30 years. Equitable access to education and public services were previous recommendations under both conventions that still need to be implemented. Gaps between departments and between federal and provincial jurisdiction are common themes under both conventions. And we have a lack of child-friendly access to justice when their rights are not respected. And finally, participation rights are a concern under both conventions. That's a big agenda, but we are hoping for some improvement through this next review process. And I'll turn it over to Steve Esty. Great, thanks. Can folks hear me okay? Yeah. I'm deaf, so it's hard for me to tell for sure. It's a real pleasure for me to be here with you and to co-present with Kathy. I, uh, I especially value that because Kathy has been a real friend to our effort with the CRPD back in the days of drafting. So for close to 20 years, you know, she helped us figure a way forward. And that was very helpful then. And it's nice to kind of come back together again. And what we talk about always in the disability world is a kind of a twin track approach, you know, where we talk about monitoring our rights, monitoring rights of people with disabilities through the CRPD, but also through all of the other conventions. And really, and I was saying this to Kathy and Kiko the other day when we were talking, we talk about a twin track approach, but really so far, it's only in the children's convention that we see much appetite for engagement of people with disabilities in the CRPD process. So I think it's valuable not just in terms of our developing a relationship with you folks in children's rights, but also with us developing a bit of a template for how we work with the Women's Convention or with the Torture Convention or with any convention, you know? So it's really very important. The other thing that I'd like to say in my remaining two minutes is that the work of monitoring the convention when we were drafting it, there was a lot of talk about the kind of paper process that Kathy talks about. You know, every four years you go to Geneva, you sit in a room, you talk for an hour or three hours, then you take a lunch break, then you talk for another three hours, then you pack up and you go home, and three and a half years later you start the process again. That's been going on with a lot of conventions for a long time, and people in those conventions are pretty fed up with it. So they're looking at ways to change them. And when we were drafting the disability convention, we were mindful of this concern. And 
one of the key innovations of the Disability Convention is Article 33, where it talks about domestic monitoring. This is what Tabitha was talking about. You know, the Commission is trying to figure a way for its role as a monitoring mechanism in the, in, at the domestic level. And that's very important. The Commission was allocated to, I think, two and a half million dollars over five years through the uh, Accessibility Act last year to figure a way forward on what domestic monitoring would look like. What didn't happen at that time and what hasn't happened yet is a similar envelope hasn't been made available to civil society. And if you look at the drafting of the convention very specifically, and you see in Article 33, two provisions. 33.2 talks about a domestic monitoring mechanism, which should be a human rights commission where they exist or where they don't, some other government created mechanism. But it also talked about a very robust mechanism for civil society organizations. And uh, that's me and Kathy and our gang. We haven't got any resources to figure that out yet. That's not because we're not going to get them. We just haven't gotten around to them yet. And I think that what I would like to leave with you folks is that for the 20 years that I've been doing this work, it's always been the civil society organizations at the end of the day that are the conscience of the process. People with disabilities, children, those are the people for whom these treaties are important and those are the people that need to be engaged fully. So while I commend the Human Rights Commission and I support their work, I will say that it's only part of the work around domestic monitoring and I look forward to going forward to civil society work. Thanks very much for the opportunity to chat with you today. Over and out. Thank you so much, Steve uh, and Kathy. This is wonderful. So we will move into um, the last interesting part of research, some of the research that has been done around uh, the rights-based approaches and will present different types of uh, data and information that uh, we are trying to contribute and join uh, efforts with the civil society organizations and others to inform on the um, on the data, on the domestic monitoring, on the reporting. So um, we've been uh, developing a model working uh, with the OHCHR Bridge the Gap indicators to try to use these uh, indicators to inform the domestic monitoring process, to inform the reporting process of the CRPD and also on the CRC. Uh, so trying to integrate, as uh, Kathy and Steve mentioned so well, those two, uh, the, the opportunity to have those two conventions working towards the inclusion of children with disabilities in Canada. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the families and youth experiences and their voices as uh, in a survey that we, um, we did and other projects that we are working with, uh, including also the research literature that uh, we have um, collected on rights-based approaches as suggestions or indicators of how we could apply those indicators into the practice, into the clinical practice of what we do in health and rehab services, but also in research and hopefully to also inform the work of communities. And uh, I feel of the, the, the attempts we're doing to analyze policy programs and legislation using tax mining methodology, we're using those indicators. So part of the review we did, uh, we uh, collected um, a systematic uh, scoping review of 112 academic articles asking what are the rights-based approaches that exist for children with disabilities, what has been done. And we identified those, uh, this research literature into five different categories. We found that it was important to identify what's the youth and parent agency, how we make them aware, how do we support parents and youth in their engagement and strategies about their rights, how we can support, uh, how we can create opportunities for individual supports and reasonable accommodation, also solutions uh, that addressed the rights of children with disabilities through person and family-centered approaches, and also uh, uh, opportunities to create and promote active citizenship. And, um, and finally, we also um, identified in the research literature how service providers need to understand this notion of rights, the right to health, the right to life, the right to play, and different rights and different um, that are understood and covered those two uh, conventions. 
We also ask children, youth, and families and organizations across Canada some of the issues and how they perceive that being important for them in their practice and their reality. Uh, and some of the issues that came as important was the need to identify and measure the physical, social, cultural, and economic barriers that exist and to develop policies that use this language to inform policies and programs at the educational level, at the health services level, that consider this notion of rights. Uh, and they also notice that children with disabilities lack opportunities to engage in these discussions. Often, even uh, when reporting on the convention, that's new that children with disabilities would be included and uh, their families are often representing them, but there are little opportunities for them to represent themselves. Using those international human rights guidelines to guide standard of services and also to facilitate participation in policy making seem to be good solutions that the research literature supports and that stakeholders I believe are important. Hoping that we'll have community inclusion, participation, and have more considerations for children and families in Canadian legislation. An example of a poem did by one of our youth participants uh, expressing how frustrating he gets when he cannot go in the places that he chooses to go. And we'll have some wonderful youth speaking today at the end. So I'll, I'll save more for that. Um, in developing or supporting research supporting a domestic monitoring process that Tabata presented earlier, we also uh, are uh, moving efforts to use a different data sets. So the public consultations leading to the Accessible Canada Act, regulations and standards uh, that are also related to the ACA, federal and provincial policies, programs, acts, decrees, human rights tribunal decisions, and uh, speech from the thrones, other uh, texts and commitment to use uh, this monitoring framework, these indicators that are proposed, thinking of structure, process, and outcomes that could support the inclusion and participation of children with disabilities. In the Accessible Canada Act, we saw very little that relates to children and families, and that's a discourse that we have to bring forward. Um, in the COVID-19 uh, responses, we're also analyzing uh, Canadian and international policy responses, and also using the indicators to identify what issues relate to children and how, uh, within the CRPD, how the other articles are addressed and how we can consider how children with disabilities will be considered and are considering the policy responses that are being produced. We know that families uh, of children with disabilities, that's another survey we did in the context of the WHO Disability Survey, and we identified that families uh, of children with disabilities in Canada, they are having challenges to get access to school services, often other services that are provided through school, and also through regular help and supports at home and in the community. It's a big challenge for families during COVID. They have been exacerbated, and we hope that solutions moving forward will also consider those. So we hope to have better opportunities uh, for integrating uh, research and generating research that can inform the domestic monitoring process, that can support civil society and disability persons organizations in this process. We're also hoping to create better partnerships across all those different groups and engage and create space for discussions and identify what really matters and how those transformations can uh, inform and feedback on all those different aspects. The Child Bright Policy Hub is a space where we're trying to inform families and youth, and uh, you'll hear more from uh, some of our youth uh, later on. So I'll leave you for that. And with that, I'll pass to uh, Leanne and with that, thank you. Thanks, Keiko. Hi, everybody. I'm Leanne Finley, um, and I'm going to be talking to you a little bit uh, today about the work we've been doing with Statistics Canada, along with my colleague, Ruba Rim. And I'd first like to just thank everybody for attending the event and for um, listening to all the things that we have to talk about uh, and presenting to you today. So next slide, please. So I'm going to be giving you a brief overview of some of the data sets that are being collected at Statistics Canada that relate to childhood disability. Um, in particular, I wanted to highlight two different data sources, the first being the Canadian Health Survey on Children and Youth. Um, this is a population-based Canadian survey that relates to the child, to, to children's health and well-being that collected data on the population ages 1 to 17 living in Canada. Um, and there, Ruba will be showing you some of the information that was published in 2019, including some of the health characteristics. 
Um, we've also recently been collecting information on the situation during COVID just to get a sense of the pulse of what's going on for Canadians and Canadian children. And there have been a series of data collection activities, one of which was um, conducted to find out more about parents' experiences during the pandemic. And in particular, we were interested in how parents of children with disabilities were being impacted. And we also have other, um, other collections in this series, including one on living with long-term conditions and disabilities, although this was for a slightly older age cohort. And as you can see here, I also show some of the other Statistics Canada data sets, but we are focusing on these two for today's presentation. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Ruba, to speak about the results. Next slide. Thanks, Leanne. So I'd like to start with the Canadian Health Survey on Children and Youth 2019 results. Um, so just to summarize, up to 17% of Canadian children have functional difficulties depending on their age group and a higher proportion of boys compared to girls have functional difficulties at younger ages, as you can see on the slides, in particular um, preschool and school age years. So that's the data set uh, from our most recent Canadian Health Survey on children and youth. Next slide, please. If we turn to the uh, parenting during the pandemic crowdsourcing data that Leanne just uh, presented, families of children with disabilities were found to be especially vulnerable to the impacts of COVID-19. Um, a higher proportion of parents of children with disabilities indicated that they were very or extremely concerned about their children's amount of screen time, loneliness or isolation, uh, general mental health, as well as their school year and academic success uh, for this year. Next slide, please. So in terms of next steps and recommendations, um, one of the things we would like to highlight is future research opportunities using the Canadian Health Survey um, on children and youth, particularly a focus on um, children rights, as well as other topics in child health and well-being. Um, with our various partners, we are also in the process of developing different survey content regarding child disability and other things that I would like to highlight in terms of next steps. And finally, I just wanted to include some of the references uh, that you may wish to go and find out uh, further information about some of the um, results that we just presented with Leanne. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, Looking forward to chatting a little bit about some of the work we've been doing around expenditure data um, and thinking about um, understanding uh, programs that we deliver in Canada and how that links up with some of the UN Convention um, objectives. So uh, when you think a little bit about child specific value considerations for policy, um, you know, put forward a, a definition of, of health as, as being this kind of resilience-based definition with an ability to adapt and self-manage in the face of social, physical, emotional challenges. And as you've heard already, and you'll hear, hear a little bit more today, key towards that is having data to understand how we're doing on those regards and, and measures and indicators, as you've heard a little bit about. So we'll go to the next slide there. So in terms of uh, actual service delivery and how that impacts uh, trajectories and developmental trajectories, um, there's a number of health and social programs that impact a delayed or disordered or at risk or healthy trajectory for children. And you know, I just highlight from this figure that these are both health and social programs that are delivered um, by, by countries and by provinces. In Canada, um, you know, we've, we've discussed a lot about a data deficit in terms of under, having the uh, data necessary to understand um, how we're doing in some of this, this regard. So we'll go to the next slide here. So we, uh, there's been some international work looking at expenditures across health and social service programs uh, in OECD countries. And you'll notice that, in fact, while we often are thinking about health expenditures in the context text of health outcomes, we know that social programs have a really big impact on um, health outcomes as well. And in fact, Canada's expenditures uh, in that regard are, are much lower than some of the OECD countries. And we'll go to the next slide. 
So in the context of uh, health and social policy, um, yeah, we looked at expenditures across health, uh, across provincial programs um, in Canada and uh, social spending across provincial programs. And uh, what was really found is the ratio of health and social spending is what's really important and has profound impacts on population measures like life expectancy and potentially avoidable mortality. So we'll go to the next slide. So this is where, you know, this understanding and in, in Canada, a lot of these the programs uh, are delivered at the provincial level. It's really understanding this ratio of social to health spending um, and, and trying to understand what services we provide that start to link up to the UN Convention commitments and um, policy objectives. So what we did uh, is compile uh, data on expenditures across uh, the provinces and started trying to map those to the UN Convention, um, UN CRPD um, articles. And you can go to the next slide. Um, we, I would encourage you to check out the website uh, that we have put together. It's a bit of a dashboard, interactive data dashboard, where we've compiled disability expenditures uh, in provinces from 2000 to up to 2018. And you can see there's a vast differences across provinces in what we spend on disability programs. There's differences in terms of income supports versus expenditures on um, programs, uh, spending on children versus adults. So, you know, it's helpful to get a sense um, so we can start measuring and monitoring. Go to the next slide. Um, and, and just wanted to highlight the importance of this in the context of knowing what we spend for programs in Canada versus other OECD countries. Um, Canada does fall a lot lower than, than many other countries with 0.8% uh, of our GDP, um, which is lower than the OECD total. And go to the next slide. And so this idea of, of expenditures, this is actually a map that a uh, parent drew of, of navigating the services provincially um, in, in Canada and, and the importance of really starting to get an understanding of the services uh, and how fragmented they are is, is a critical step in um, really starting to better be able to address and monitor some of the outcomes. Next slide. So we just have a, a couple of projects uh, coming up that we're working on, which is monitoring uh, provincial data expenditures. So that map that you just saw, we're trying to look at administrative data and link that together to better understand trajectories across programs and, and over the life course. Um, and uh, we'll go to the next slide. There's a, uh, and then we'll just go to the, the next slide just for the sake of time here. Uh, and we have another project on uh, COVID-19 and mental health and, and substance use and really trying to understand service use uh, and per perspectives of families over time. Uh, um, and so looking forward to working on some of these projects to better address some of the, the policy um, issues and objectives uh, that were discussed. And so I'll hand it over to our next presenter and these are our kind of policy recommendations that were circulated. Thank you. Hi everyone, I am Lisa Wolf. I'm with UNICEF Canada and I'm joining you tonight from the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, Peyton Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the New Credit who hold the treaty in my area. And I'm gonna provide a high level overview of a partnership to bring stakeholders together in Canada around children and youth. Um, we're doing this over a short period of time with a sense of urgency to surface shared priorities that we want governments and other decision makers to take up as we move into a new and politi uh, politically, socially, and economically challenging period of the pandemic. So on behalf of our partners, Children's Healthcare Canada, and Emily Grunwald is here with me as well, uh, the Pediatric Chairs of Canada, the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, particularly the Institute for Healthy Child Development and UNICEF Canada, we want to take this opportunity to invite you into this process. Um, the first, the reason we came together at this time is that we feel, as I mentioned, a sense of urgency to try something different to lift up the health and well-being of children and youth in Canada and to pursue equity. 
Um, Canada is one of the richest of rich countries with some of the poorest outcomes in children's mental and physical health, protection from violence, and support of relationships with families, peers, and school. And despite a steady accumulation of wealth in Canada, progress in these areas has stalled and inequity gaps are stubbornly wide. UNICEF Report Card 16, which came out in September, reviewed the most recent data and found that in every child policy indicator we looked at, Canada lags behind better performing countries for children. And you see some patterns that Jennifer just uh, described as well. Um, policies that should be universal, but with progressive measures that create equity by reaching the most vulnerable are simply not extensive or inclusive enough, although we do recognize that recent advances um, are being made. Children with disabilities are among the most likely to be excluded from these policies, like childcare and parental leave, or not sufficiently included to achieve substantive equity in policies like income benefits to families with children. But children with disabilities are also often excluded or insufficiently included in systems and policies like health and education, where Canada invests comparatively more than in other rich countries. We fall backwards in childcare, parental leave, income benefits, but we in, invest more than other OECD countries in health and education. So um, it becomes you know, a particular concern when, when children with disabilities are, are left out of these programs. And how much farther will we allow them to fall out of these programs and services due to the pandemic? If we can go to the next slide, Inspiring Healthy Futures is a collaboration that our organizations have formed to bring, uh, sorry, the previous slide, yeah, to bring uh, civil society in all sectors closer together to understand each other's priorities and look for where we can better align and be good partners to each other and to government in setting priorities because every sector has responsibilities to children with disabilities. And emerging priority themes that we're seeing in the first few months of our engagement, uh, which has encompassed more than 900 stakeholders at this point, include creating more equitable access to children's health care services, including child development services in every community, and more substantial resources to support families of children with disabilities. In the next slide, uh, you'll see um, a sort of map of emerging themes that these stakeholders are raising. And it aligns remarkably well with the Convention on the Rights of the Child, as well as our Canadian Index of Child and Youth Wellbeing. Um, priority areas participants are raising include not only education and healthcare, but also still the need to meet basic needs in a rich country, play and mobility and hope for the future. And children with disabilities exist in every sphere and have been made visible in this process. So uh, as we move through the process on the next slide, um, we're aiming for a, a, a wider still and more diverse web of participants over the next four months. And we'll see how this thematic map changes and begin to look for interconnections, not only between those themes, but between the policy influencers, the researchers, the service providers and communities that that they connect. So please check out our evolving opportunities to join in or just check in on our progress at wecanforkids.ca. I'll put it in the chat. And there's a great youth event planned for Saturday at 11.30 Eastern time uh, for the young people here. Uh, and uh, finally, in the next slide, just want to make you aware on this day of uh, persons with disabilities that UNICEF has released a new global report um, documenting examples of how services uh, for children with disabilities have been disrupted around the world, but also examples of what's been done to address and prevent disruptions and, uh, and look at the challenges in generating disability inclusive data during the pandemic. I can put the link to that also in the chat. So, um, Emily, I don't know if you've got anything to add that I've left out, but thank you so much everyone for the opportunity to join you on this special day. 
Super. Only just to add, Lisa, that I've added in the chat um, some opportunities to find out more information about how you can choose to become involved, especially over the next four to six weeks. There'll be a number of different online uh, engagement opportunities. So I hope you'll check it out. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, we're having just a little glitch. <laughs> sure, would you mind? No, it's fine. Alex, there's no voice. Put some issues and solutions, and I'll come back to talk about next steps. So background, just about little CASDA. In 2007, a group of nonprofit organizations came together to advocate for government action on for autism. The founding members of CASDA all believed that there was more the Canadian government could do for autism through their leadership and a national strategy. Since then, this alliance has grown to over 100 member organizations and worked towards the vision of autistic Canadians realizing their rights as fellow citizens. National autism strategy means aligning policies, programs, and services across Canada with that vision. So over those years, there's been a maturation of the autism sector, as with many other disability sectors, and, uh, and that has begun including the voice of autistic people. This aligns with the CRPD, and as we heard in the opening remarks of this conference, that disabled peoples are subjects and not objects in advocacy. At the same time, over the years, inequalities still abound in service access by age group, region, culture, and race. Last year, in 2019, the federal government of Canada has committed to developing a national autism strategy, and consultation processes have begun this year. So moving on to solutions, over to Rebecca. How can we first, how can we realize the CRPD more fully through a national autism strategy? Right. Disability rights, including autism, are moving towards the social model of disability. The CRPD aligns with this model. A social model of disability means the barriers are removed rather than disabled people needing to change themselves. When barriers are removed, people are more independent and equal in society. We should see this develop in training and education and in the language that is used will build a more inclusive environment as part of national autism strategy alongside specific needs that are to be addressed. Personally, I'm teaching myself and my children how to identify systemic barriers, derogatory attitudes and social exclusion in order to shape our environment and create environments for other disabled people that are more inclusive. Thanks. And I guess for children on the autism spectrum, you alluded to this already, but what else uh, is part of an inclusive social environment? An inclusive social environment happens when we address how disabled children are being denied full participation, exposed to prejudicial attitudes and inaccessible social activities. These are real issues which create the current barriers that disable autistic children. Education and training are important to reduce stereotypes of autism and to increase understanding of the complex needs of autistic Canadians in order to accommodate children in public spaces where proper accommodations are not currently in place. 
Inclusion is about offering the same activities to everyone while providing support and services to accommodate people's differences. That's a great definition. Are there other examples of full inclusion, Rebecca, that you can think of? Sure. Currently in environments like hospitals, public service buildings, and spaces the government runs, there can be difficulty in fully accessing the services by disabled or autistic people. These environments can be stressful, and when an autistic person is under stress, it can become hard to process information at the same speed that everybody, everything else is happening. It's essential to have the government engage and have a deeper understanding of issues like this and accommodate the needs of the autistic community and bring us closer to equality in services and realize our rights more fully. Yeah, and having first voice advocates like yourselves with representation uh, from, the across, from across the entire spectrum is a very much needed next step. And to make that happen uh, for systemic change, it's an asset. And now uh, we'll talk about how to move on to next steps and uh, course of action moving forward. Right. In terms of next steps for a national autism strategy, what advocacy work is going on in Canada in autism? So at CASDA, we have organized policy areas that are under federal jurisdiction in Canada so that components are actionable by the federal government. We have a roadmap with feasible quick wins, medium-term and long-term actions that the government can take as the strategy is being developed. These are laid out in sequence. Working towards a national autism strategy that is sustainable and scalable to other disabilities is paramount. There are components that have policy levers to affect greater change across other disability areas. For example, ensuring consistent financial support for all those with disabilities in Canada and having specific tax credits as avenues for governments to support all disabled Canadians. This year at CASDA, we also launched uh, and gathered stakeholder opinions and launched a policy brief compendium. Uh, this includes policy recommendations that the community wants to see across these pillars of policy action. And lastly, we are launching a journal for equity in the sector to build up first voice advocacy capacity in Canada. This journal will focus on equity and policy implications. That journal sounds like a great move forward. Last question, how will a national autism strategy impact the future for children with disabilities and what is the role of data and monitoring for that? Yeah, so the National Autism Strategy can be a starting point for change and it shouldn't be an end point. Certain areas of the National Autism Strategy have a broader impact beyond the autism community. At CASDA, we advocate for a National Autism Strategy to have a sustainable, continuous improvement model. An improvement requires data to inform change. So monitoring and data are essential to informed policy making around the progressive realization of the CRPD for autistic Canadians. We cannot meaningfully change what we don't know and don't measure. So in closing, we want to thank our side event sponsors, our fellow panelists, and the uh, UN DESA for this opportunity to speak here. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jonathan and Rebecca. Canada has produced a number of articles and op-eds that outline the effect that the global pandemic has had on disabled children and their families in Canada. Uh, what remains a challenge is that we haven't really advanced beyond messaging that states that they have been disproportionately affected. For a lot of families, this feels like a message that isn't being heard. Next slide, please. In connecting with a variety of families across Canada, the message has been very common uh, that what has been previously considered cracks in the system have now become cavernous. According to an article written last year in the Journal of the American Medical Association, parents and caregivers can spend up to an average of 52 hours a week performing nursing care. The pandemic saw an initial removal of those supports that would have allowed families to at least get some rest. Also, some have not seen a return of some of those early intervention supports either. Many families struggled with finding out how to present at the emergency room with health conditions connected to their diagnosis without risking exposure to COVID-19. School remained inconsistent and in some cases exclusionary 
given the lack of resources uh, afforded to school divisions, as well as inconsistent health messaging. For some, staff roles meant to support children uh, within the school system were redeployed elsewhere to support pandemic testing facilities. Uh, this role was initially understood, but shock came when the staff found themselves without a job at school starting in the fall. Next slide, please. Important questions remain here. How do we move forward? Childhood disability is complex subject matter with unique variables and intersectional factors to consider. Adopted the, fra the phrase build back better in discussing its, their efforts in pandemic recovery. Not just a catchphrase, but a contract with all Canadians to ensure uh, that persons with disabilities across the nation have all the supports necessary to thrive. For children, this comes with reimagining a system that realizes consensus on how we support child health in Canada. This comes with adopting a social model on health and disability from early years and across the lifespan. Next slide, please. There are some fascinating initiatives that have come across about during this pandemic that I feel are deserving of investment in spreading and scaling across Canada. Arch Disability aims to teach community knowledge brokers about the optional protocol. The idea is that these community champions will move the message of accessing rights in Canada to more people who need it. My COVID Disability Q was a social media initiative for scientists to answer questions on child health and family support during the pandemic. If you've heard, you've also heard in our presentation today that We Can for Kids is disability inclusive in its framework for child health. Another example is Envisage, which is an emerging study with an aim to foster connection with their, uh, for parents with their children without negative messaging and fostering confidence and empowerment in connection and, and their skills to advocate for their kids after a disability diagnosis. Their ongoing work has goals to reach service providers, First Nations families, and low resource format for a larger global outreach. Cerebral Palsy Alberta created a re-entry strategy that provides guidance on a number of pandemic subjects and frankly should be an example of how co-design with those with lived experience generates rele relevant material that people can actually use. Two years ago, I had the privilege of sharing about my son in a side session in New York, extolling the necessity of a support model that allows for the building of full lives and clear paths to adulthood. I expressed a desire for the needs and realities of families to be seen and mobilized at a policy level. My message remains the same today. However, it continues on in the memory of my son who passed away earlier this year. We aren't the voices of our children, but we are their microphones and we are ready to be heard and lend a hand as we build back better. Next slide, please. And now I'd like to introduce to you enough. So my name is Anaf Habib and I'm a physically disabled 13 year old resident from Toronto, Ontario. And today I'd like to speak to you regarding a few challenges that disabled individuals in Canada endure. Firstly, I'd like to discuss methods of convenient and accessible transportation, particularly intermunicipal transportation. In Canada, many physically disabled individuals cannot access conventional public transit for an extensive period of time due to our exceptional weather, often causing blockages of entry points to traditional public transit, such as bus stops. Therefore, these individuals require door-to-door -door transportation methods, such as Toronto's Real Trans or Montreal para Montreal's Paratransit. While these services are available in many municipalities for travel within the municipal border, there are few affordable services offered for intermunicipal transportation. This restricts a disabled individual's freedom of movement, a fundamental freedom according to the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. This, is, this also limits 
the opportunities for cultural, artistic, educational, recreational, and leisure activity. As many activities and opportunities may be based just outside the border of, one in, of one's municipality. However, the individual may not be able to transport themselves due to weather conditions and not being able to afford expensive services such as a taxi. Therefore, I propose a system similar to wheel trans, but imp implemented on a federal scale, providing door-to-door -door transportation at an affordable rate for all disabled Canadian individuals. Secondly, a disabled child's access to education is limited by a shortage of accessible schools for children who require mobility devices such as wheelchairs, scooters, and walkers. A shortage of accessible schools restrict an individual's school choice or inconvenience system to attend a school far from their primary residence. A lack of accessible schools prohibits a disabled individual from enrolling in various vocational and otherwise special programs, particularly in secondary schools, in some cases interfering with the pursuit of certain careers. Therefore, I would like all permanent vocational or special programs to have at least one accessible school per borough of a large municipality or municipal region, or one per rural municipality to increase student school choices. I'd also like the government to fund the renovation of as many educational and public institutions as possible to increase their accessibility for Canadians with a physical disability. Thank you for listening to my ideas. Now we'll hear from uh, Jacob. Hello, my name is Jacob Bertinol and I am 17 years old and I am speaking from the South Shore of Montreal, Canada. I have epilepsy, autism, and dyslexia. Here are my top four suggestions based on my experiences. First, I would like more access to part-time jobs for teens like me. I would also like more training for employers and employees so they understand how to work with teens with autism so they don't bully me or treat me unfairly. Secondly, I would like more resources in the school special needs offices so that they can meet the needs of all students like me. For example, I go to an English program to learn how to repair airplanes. It's the only English program for the Semai province. It's run from a French CJEP, so the staff at the special needs office only speak French, so most cannot help me in English. Thirdly, I would like more free time. It's a lot harder for me to learn with my dyslexia. In grade nine, my marks dropped in the harder classes, like math, causing me to quit my favorite sport, speed skating to study all night. Speed skating was important for me because it brought me joy and because I was competing at the provincial level. I also had to go to summer school for two summers, which cost money too. I wish that school was more flexible and let me take class classes per term. The kids who get higher grades can do a program called Spark Etude, but with my learning disabilities, I was now able to qualify for a program like this. Lastly, I'm probably not the only one, but discrimination is another thing that has impacted me, and I want more help to understand and deal with discrimination. Most of my life, I've been bullied or made fun of by people, but I didn't always realize that I was being bullied, and I didn't understand why people were treating me unfairly. Now I know that it's because of my autism. I think that autism should be taught to every class in school so that everyone understands it better. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Jacob. We are, we're here from Emma now. You're welcome. Hello, uh, my name is Emma Felices Costello and I am 12 years old and I live in Winnipeg. I have a nine-year-old sister with a profound intellectual disability and a seizure disorder. Her name is Ale. Because of her disability, she cannot speak in a language we can understand, yet. Because Ali is in my life, I'm more responsible, more empathetic, and certainly more patient than my friends. Family of the child's disabilities has more responsibility and expectations, leading to more stress, anxiety, and depression. I feel these families might need additional support mentally, economically, and socially. Especially if you are a glass child, you need a person that's been through it for someone to really understand. A glass child is a sibling of, special, of a child with special needs. We are called a glass child because we are overlooked by the higher needs of our sibling. I am a glass child and needed a mentor to guide me, but there wasn't any support. 
It has been proven that a glass child is quite a bit more stressed thinking of the future, and many of us have peer problems. I am an extremely important part of Ale's life because I am her closest friend. As well, once my parents die, me and my other sister will be supporting her and helping her make decisions. Because the siblings are so important, why is there no mention of them in the report about children with disabilities? There are direct mentions to parents, but there are no mentions of other family members. It is very common that, de that the definition of family-centered care only includes parents, both literally and figuratively leading, leaving siblings in the waiting room. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. Um, thank you, uh, everyone who participated. So this is a great way to, uh, to end our uh, presentation part uh, with really the, the true uh, champions and the, the advocates that you heard. I will invite our panelists to turn on their cameras and mics and uh, we'll have not a lot of time, but we do have a little bit of time uh, for some questions. Um, I will ask you, uh, for all of you who are here with us, to uh, ask uh, to uh, write your questions in, in the chat feature. You could also raise your hand and uh, we'll, um, we'll see uh, in, the, in the participant list. I can see if you raise your hand, there's a raise hand feature. Uh, if you raise your hand, I can see you and I will, uh, you, can, you can speak. Uh, but you can also type your questions. And I see I read a question <laughs> from the end. So perhaps we'll start from there, um, from the questions on the chat. Please, everyone, feel free to, um, you could, uh, I don't know if you well, don't need to turn on your camera, but better not for interpretation, sorry. But uh, please chat or uh, type your question on the chat and I uh, will try to, get this going. So I will read the question uh, from um, Liane in the chat. Uh, she says that the in schools protections are in place for our children with disabilities and people are accountable in upholding them, but defending our children from discrimination during leisure activities is out of reach to many and not an easy, eff not an easy effort if you cannot afford a lawyer. How and when will Canada ensure that every single child in our country be equitable protected from discrimination and every other protection afforded while in school in all areas of their lives, including private sports, teams, religious groups, and uh, coding clubs? Excellent points. Um, anyone wants to um, jump at this? If, um, I will I will start I guess just because the leisure cup question is some it's part of a part, part of my my research but excellent question thank you so much Alien for bringing this up um, I can't speak for Canada I guess this is uh, the question is when will Canada but we are certainly need to uh, to uh, try to find better solutions to have inclusive environments. Um, I believe that the Weekend for Kids is one of the strategies working towards this direction, right? To make sure that children are included in and thought through in all aspects of um, policy development, of community participation. Um, some a sort of some parts of my research are on aspects related to leisure. We have developed an app. It's called Shuwe. I'll put on the chat. Uh, to uh, have inclusive activities listed to at least give access to families and uh, we're trying to um, develop other ways to have this information out and to promote those inclusive environments that's one attempt um, but for sure there are other initiatives that uh, need to be thought uh, participation is another pan-canadian initiative that is working actively towards finding inclusive solutions, uh, particularly for leisure and uh, some of those um, areas and sport participation in sports as well. Steve says he can comment uh, on. So Steve, I'll uh, turn the mic to you. Sure, yeah. You know me, Kiko, I can always comment. Mm. Um, I think the question for me, you know, it points to the existence of organizations, primarily of parents of kids with disabilities, that exist for exactly that reason, to lobby and to advance supports for their children. So I think of organizations like the Canadian Association for Community Living, which has recently renamed itself as Inclusion Canada. I think, you know, 
that there's a tendency to think that they work only for kids with intellectual disabilities, but I don't think that's the case. I think also Jonathan might be able to comment, but I believe that there are organizations that work on behalf of kids with autism. And I think that, you know, it, it's much easier, and I say this as the parent of a disabled child myself, but it's much easier to work with an organization in solidarity to advance policy changes than it is to go to the school and keep banging your fist on the table and saying, my Johnny needs this or my Susie needs that. That, that just gets, it's exhausting, you know? You're worn out by the time the kid is nine years old and you've got another 15 years of work. So I think it's much better to work with organizations like that. Excellent point. Thank you, Steve. I think the collaborations and partnerships is uh, so essential, right? So for, for parents to uh, work with organizations, with researchers and other groups. Uh, Jonathan, do you want to comment on that? Sure, just really quickly. I, I think the way, you know, going to the original question, I think the way the CRPD uh, was set up and how the optional protocol works is for organizations to go bring it up at the final level when there's when all domestic re, um, domestic mechanisms have been exhausted. So as part of it is to be able to find organization groups. And uh, I see some comments from the end. Yeah, organizations aren't always aware of how disability can present. And I totally agree. And I think that's, you know, that's on us as or, uh, people who work in these organizations, people who work in research to better understand and uh, partner with uh, and co-develop and understand what's going on. And uh, uh, but ultimately, um, as I mentioned uh, in the video, um, to allow for first voice advocacy. You know, that's what it comes down to. We have to continue to build the capacity in these areas and for children to make sure uh, parents have the tools um, and are informed in, in, in some of these decisions and forming these organizations. Um, I'll leave it at that for now. There's a few other questions coming in. Um, I guess, uh, sorry. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. Oh my God, I'm still on this call. What are you guys making? <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> what, what's for dinner? That's part of soon. We have someone with their mic on. Uh, and I can't see because there are too many screens. So that's good. So um, I guess I will uh, go to, to the next question that I see here. So uh, individuals with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder are often left out of disability discussion. And the prevalence of FASD is higher than autism, cerebral palsy, and Down syndrome combined. How can FASD advocates get FASD on the disability agenda? This is an excellent question. Thank you. Um, I would like to take on that. <laughs> I, I'd be happy to comment a bit on that uh, from sure. the stakeholder side. Uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the barriers that we have in the research field is that from publishing to implementation, a uh, great challenge is that there's often a 17 year gap. And so we need to consider as people, boots on the ground, stakeholders, whatever you wish to say, uh, how we start to bridge that together. And that comes with networking. And I, I, am, I rack my brain about this personally on a constant level as to how we streamline uh, bringing organizations together in ways that make sure that everybody receives the same information going down the pipeline. So the, I think if there is an ideal to get everybody at the table, we need to know who is out there. We need to know who is working on what, and we need to just make sure that that general awareness makes sure that everybody knows what sort of mechanisms are available in order to participate and have a seat at the table. Um, so that is a big grand, um, dream, I think, of mine in order to figure out how we can do this with the greatest efficiency. I think there are simpler steps in there too, some low, low hanging goals that we have in mind, but at the same time, um, in the grand scheme of things, we need to get our information more streamlined, if that makes sense. Absolutely, Rachel. Uh, Jonathan, you wanted to comment on? Sure. Um, and I, you know, FASD, I think the Canadian rate from what I know is about 4%, right? And it, it is high. 
um, you know, so I think what, what I can tell from the autism sectors, um, once you, it's the collective impact model, you know, bringing uh, parents together along with um, advocates across the board um, to have that as uh, working together, working collaboratively. What has happened in the autism sector uh, has been this massive organization since 2007 in Canada, at least. And that has allowed for the, the momentum behind the strategy. So I think, you know, I, I would encourage that to be sort of how we think, uh, work collaboratively, uh, have a shared goal, have some consensus. And, you know, the CRPD gives us a lot of ways to think about a rights-based approach um, to tackle these um, in a unified way as a sector in neurodevelopmental disabilities, for sure. Great point. Um, Jeff, any Anyone else wants uh, to add to this? I just, I just jump in quickly. I mean, I think to add on those, those great points, the other thing I would say is um, trying to reframe the conversation around uh, functional needs and trying to design services in a way that kind of address uh, the, the different functional needs across different disorders, disabilities, uh, autism, FASD. You know, there's a lot of common um, from a policy and service delivery perspective, there's no need to be separating them in that way so you know i think some of it's breaking down some of our existing systems and and really thinking about how to optimize the services that we do deliver and ensure that they're they're reaching people who who need them regardless of diagnosis i agree <laughs> um i also i think from uh that's a from the systems perspective and the crpd um perspective. We do need to understand what the different needs, but uh, we're not, uh, we, we should work towards solutions that work for most, right, that are inclusive of different types of disabilities that are according to the needs and not to specific diagnosis labels. Um, I see our time is already past five minutes. I will get question, the, the, the last question uh, from Hala that is in the chat. Is it unfortunate but most schools are, un are not equipped and not all teachers have the tools the skills it would be great if more work and training is done in teacher education programs i think collaboration in this area is essential totally um agree uh, Hala. i think uh, part of what we've been uh, seeing a lot of the the interactions right between uh, the health and education systems and between the crc the thinking that goes on the crc and the crpd uh, is also important. Yesterday, um, Ida had um, a forum host uh, at an event that was talking about this, um, the approaches that the, the both committees, uh, the CRC and the CRPD committees are taking. So there's one important task force towards um, residential um, living accommodations for children and thinking what are the um, commonalities and the points that could be improved across uh, conventions to make this a reality, I guess. Education is another important point uh, that is a clear interaction, leisure, so many areas, right? Um, so unfortunately, our time is up. Um, I will ask, and that is not, uh, I had, we had not agreed on, but I don't know if our panelists, um, Sia, Tabata, Lian, Hubab, Lisa, Emily, um, Rachel, everyone. <laughs> I don't see all. Rebecca, thank you. Um, as if you have any final words, uh, considerations um, to make before we wrap up. Well, thank you. I just, you know, I'm a little slow off the mark answering the first question. I've been really thinking about it. Um, you know, I'm hopeful that the the Convention on the Rights of the Child reporting process, which is asking the Government of Canada now in the list of issues about where are the child rights impact assessments, you know, where is the decision making lens that asks how are different groups of children going to be positively or negatively affected by a decision, a policy, where are they? Um, you know, that type of um, assessment should be applied by any authority. It should be applied by foundations who are funding private sports. It should be applied by authorities like school systems and other, you know, human rights mechanisms like independent advocates should be in those systems for children. Um, and it's a, it's a road ahead to get those in, but I think there's a, there's a part of the solution there as well. I agree. Thank you, Lisa. Anyone has a final 
words that you would like to share? Jennifer? <laughs> Point at you, but <laughs> no, we're good. Um, okay, so uh, thank you everyone. Uh, I think this was, and I see uh, the, a lot of the chat. So uh, just to, uh, to thank you everyone, thank you the panelists for this uh, excellent, very informative session. Uh, thank you all for attending at late at night <laughs> and uh, different, from different parts of uh, Canada and the world. Um, it's really uh, been a, a great discussion. We, um, we hope to have, uh, we'll have the, the recording uh, streamed on the UNDESA website uh, later this week, I guess. And uh, so if you're, if you're interested, uh, please, uh, you can follow up and uh, we'll can, we can send you the, the recording and but the, the link for the recording will be available. So thank you, everyone. Uh, it was a pleasure and uh, we'll see you. <laughs>